Well, I uh, want to thank Hans for inviting me. It's uh, nice to be here in Turkey for the first time. You know, guns make it easier for bad things to happen, but they also make it easier for people to protect themselves and prevent bad things from happening. And the concern that unites everybody is what's the net effect? That net in the presence of guns save lives or cost lives? What impact do they have on crimes that threaten people from everything from rape, robbery, and aggravated assault? Um, when I've given talks uh, in the United States and around the world on uh, the issue of guns, um, I think one comment that's been made to me very frequently is that uh, guns are probably one issue that facts don't matter. That's just such an emotional issue. And I think that's wrong. I think uh, facts matter a lot in this case. But you have to think of facts much more broadly than simple numbers because guns are probably one issue that people feel they're more informed about than almost any other issue. And that is because you can't pick up newspapers or listen to news reports and not very frequently hear about some story involving guns. And so people draw conclusions based on the information that they receive, and they are constantly bombarded with information on the issue of guns. The thing with guns, though, isn't uh, so much that people aren't being informed. The concern that I often have in addressing the issue is how balanced the information that they're receiving. Because I think, well, it's pretty easy for most people to think of stories about bad things that happen with guns. If there's a shooting in the United States, uh, some type of mobile victim public shooting, it's very likely to get worldwide attention. Uh, but it's probably relatively hard for most people to think of the times that people use guns to go and stop attacks. Uh, I'm going to concentrate a lot on the issue of the United States right now because, uh, but I'll talk about some other countries too. But I think one of the reasons for doing it is the United States has often held up as kind of a poster child that people point to for information about the cause and benefits of guns. Uh, it's kind of one extreme case in terms of gun ownership rates. So if you look around the world, some place like Switzerland, for example, probably has a gun ownership rate that's about 20% higher than the United States. You have countries like Finland and Norway, which have gun ownership rates not appreciably different than what you have in the United States. And there are some other countries in the world. Israel, for example, probably has a gun possession rate that's the highest in the world. Um, with regard to the United States, I think uh, a lot of people have at least a rough idea of, uh, of some of the numbers involving crime and other bad things that happen with guns. Uh, in recent years, you're probably talking about someplace between nine and 10,000 murders that are committed each year with guns. Uh, there's something between about 650 and about 700 actual gun deaths that occur each year. Uh, and uh, if you Look at crimes that are committed generally with guns. There's about 250,000 crime, gun crimes that are reported to police. If you look at surveys uh, done by the Justice Department of the United States, you'll find that uh, they indicate that about 450,000 times a year uh, you have uh, gun crimes. And the reason why we rely on surveys is that a lot of crimes simply aren't reported to police. So if it's something like rape, for example, probably not only about half of rapes are reported to police. You look at something like larceny, which are involving things like stealing tape decks from an unattended car, you're talking about maybe only about 7%, maybe 8% of those crimes are reported to police. So we often rely on surveys to at least try to get a rough idea of how frequently those crimes occur. So while I think a lot of people may have some general idea of the harms committed with guns, my guess is they're a lot less familiar with the benefits that occur for them. So, for example, uh, if you look at similar surveys uh, in the United States of defensive gun uses, uh, surveys indicate that people use guns defensively like around two million times a year. So that's about four to five times more frequently that people use guns to stop crime than to commit them. But if you were to go and ask most people what the ratio would be, they'd probably think that anything, it's even more lopsided in the other direction in terms of the ratio of crimes committed with guns to crime stop. And I think a lot of that has to just do with the media coverage of, of, of the guns. So you, know, you get uh, media coverage generally, uh, 
one thing that I tried to do uh, a few years ago was to go and look at uh, the television news reports of the United States and the top 100 newspapers. And if you look at in 2001, for example, if you looked at all the news reports on gun crimes on uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS, the three major news networks, you'd find about 190,000 words worth of news stories on gun crimes. That's about the average article was about 280 words in length. By contrast, there was not one single story during that entire year of a citizen using a gun to protect themselves or protect somebody else. Uh, it was a newspaper coverage that was almost as in doubt. Um, New York Times, for example, that year had about 51,000 words of news stories on gun crimes, uh, just contemporaneous gun crimes. So ignoring later stories about the criminal justice process, the trial and other things, but just looking within a few days of the crime actually committed, being committed. By contrast, the New York Times had one story of a retired police officer who had used a gun to stop a, a robbery, an armed robbery at a gasoline station in New York City. Uh, in fact, of the top three largest newspapers in the United States, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, that was the single defensive gun use that was reported. Uh, if you look at the top 10 newspapers in the United States, about 75% of the defensive gun use stories that were reported were in, uh, were in two of the newspapers, the Dallas Morning News and the Houston Chronicle. And uh, I mentioned well, Texas. I'm sure people around the world have some image of what the Texans are like. But uh, uh, so I just would call up the crime reporters there to find out if there was something in the water or something that uh, caused them to report it differently. And what happened was those two newspapers just viewed themselves as the newspapers of records. So when anybody got killed, whether it was a victim or a criminal, it would still get reported. Now, it's true, if it was a victim being killed, it would be much more likely to be on the front page and much more likely to be a long story. But you still have some article, even if it was 50 words of length, buried back in the newspaper if, uh, if a criminal got killed. And generally, if you look at news coverage, the smaller the newspaper, rural newspapers were much more likely to carry stories of defensive gun uses, even though the survey data that we have indicates that the vast majority of defensive gun uses occur where the crimes occur, and that is in, in large urban areas. And it's precisely in those areas that you just don't see any news coverage of uh, defensive uses, or to the extent you do, it's extremely rare. Now, if you look at this imbalance in the media, and I think a lot of it's really easy to explain, and that is, if you were an editor of a newspaper and you had two stories that came across your desk, in one case, there was an innocent victim who had been killed, or in another case, let's say you had a woman who brandished a gun, the would-be attacker ran away, no shots were fired, no dead body on the ground, no crime actually committed, you're not even completely sure what crime would have been committed. It'd be a pretty easy judgment. I think virtually everybody who picked the case where you have a dead body on the ground, uh, the innocent victim is being much more newsworthy than this other type of crime that was stopped. And if you believe the survey evidence, about 95% or so of the time that people use guns to pass it, so you have sufficient to go and stop the crime. So you don't even have a uh, In fact, if you have a house are hit by which are stopped by guns. Do uh, you have uh, the criminal being killed? And maybe they're injured about seven or eight times more frequently, but it's still just a tiny fraction of what percent. Uh, if you look at the, the few news stories that are done on defensive gun uses, uh, about 70% of the reporting involve cases where the criminal's been killed. Almost all the other 30% involve cases where the criminal's been wounded. So you would think, Every time somebody uses a gun defensively, it's a case where the criminal gets killed in this about. But in fact, that's kind of what makes it newsworthy, even though it's extremely rare. But it's this newsworthiness that uh, gives you kind of a misimpression of even what happens in the cases where people go and use, uh, use guns defensively. Now, uh, you know, we care about both types of stories. You care about cases where innocent victims get killed. You also care about 
cases where uh, where people use guns to protect themselves, at least from a policy perspective. But it's even whatever we care about in terms of policy, it's very understandable in terms of what's newsworthy, what's going to get covered and what's not going to get covered. As I said, I think most of us would uh, would come to those decisions ourselves in the same way. Now, that doesn't answer everything. Because while I think the vast majority of what's decided to be covered or not is pretty easy to explain just on the basis of what's newsworthy, I don't think it explains everything. Uh, you know, probably the most obvious case involved these multiple victim public shootings. Um, here you have cases that when they occur, they get not only national but international coverage. And yet, when a multiple victim public shooting in the United States involves a civilian using his gun to stop the crime, only about 1% or fewer of the news stories will actually mention that's how it got stopped. If you look at cases where, let's say, a police officer stops crime, on average, you'll see about 36% of the news stories will mention that a police officer used his gun to stop the crime. Um, you know, so, for example, relatively few people, even in the United States, know that about 25% of the public school shootings that have occurred have been stopped by citizens with guns well before the police were able to arrive. And the reason why they're unlikely to know that is simply because of what's being newsworthy and what's not. Um, you know, so for example, if you take the first of the public school shootings that took place in uh, in October, early October 1997, uh, in which two students were killed at Pearl, Mississippi High School, there was an assistant principal there at the school, Joel Myrick, who was a former Marine. He used to carry, he had a permit to carry a concealed handgun. And he would regularly carry his permit concealed handgun with him on, uh, on the school campus up until the end of 1995 when the Federal Safe School Zone Act was passed in the United States, banning guns within a thousand feet of the school unless a state specifically passed legislation exempting uh, permit holders to be able to do that. Um, anyway, when the attack occurred that day, he had been a good law abiding citizen locked his gun in his car, parked the car more than a quarter of a mile off the school property. He had to run a half mile, literally, to go and get his gun, a half mile back. And yet he was still able to go and stop the attacker and hold him in point blank range for about five and a half minutes before the police were able to run. The, the killer there was in the process of leaving the school there to go across down the street to a, a, the junior high and continue his attack there when he was stopped. But if you go and do what's called a nexus search, anybody who's a lawyer here might be familiar with this, and that is a computerized database of news stories, what you'll find is that in the, in the uh, month after that attack, about 687 separate news stories, not counting wire services that get reprinted over and over again. You'll find that of those 687 stories, only 19 mention the assistant principal in any way. Only 13 of the 19 mentioned the assistant principal had something to do with stopping the attack, and only 10 of the 13 mentioned the assistant principal used the gun to stop the attack. Of those 10, eight of those were in local newspapers near where the attack had occurred. Two of them were in national media. One was on ABC, the over the night news broadcast for Insomniacs, was at 4 a.m. and had a sentence on it. And the next day, CNN uh, had uh, about a sentence that they mentioned on, it, on their early prime at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and you see similar types of things, attacks in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, Santee, California, uh, Duke of Kentucky, uh, other cases where civilians use their guns to go and stop these attacks, where we see only about 1% of the news stories uh, mentioned. I'll give you another example. Um, uh, about five years ago now, there was an attack at uh, the Appalachian Law School in Virginia. Uh, and uh, there are three people killed in the attack. Uh, there are two students there uh, who, were, when they heard the shots, ran to their cars, got their tools from their cars, came back. Their, their cars were parked off of school property because of uh, they had faced expulsion if they had, had the guns on school property in the car. And they came back, pointed their guns at the attacker, ordered them to the ground, 
Uh, he grabbed his gun. Another student tackled him. The three of them held him on the ground for 11 and a half minutes before the police were able to arrive. If you go and do a nexus search on that again, you'll find that in the one week after that attack, about 218 separate stories. Of those 218 separate stories, only three mentioned that the students had used their guns to stop the attack. Um, you know, again, you go on. One of the things that interested me there, I been on the radio with uh, national radio talk show host at the time, Larry Elder, and I had heard about this. And Larry had gotten one of the two students who used their guns to stop the attack to be interviewed at the same time. And the student was explaining how he'd been, how he, the day of the attack, he'd been interviewed by reporters from like 50 different publications. And having access to this Nexus and Westlaw search would be very similar. He had gone and looked up his name just to see the news coverage, just to see how they had told him. And he was just shocked by the fact that none of the people who had interviewed him seemed to have included him in the story. And I thought, well, you know, it's a young kid. Maybe you know, he's exaggerating a little bit on this. And so what I decided to do uh, was call up 50 reporters whose stories that I had found uh, and looked at. And Asked him a couple questions. One of the questions was, did they know about the facts? Did they know about the students who were subject? And all the talk you want about the students who were themselves and personally talk to the students. And the second thing that I wanted to know is, why then didn't they mention this in their stories? Uh, you have something like the Washington Post, Maria Glad, the reporter there, who would go and say that um, uh, the students had had pounced on the attacker, New York Daily News, which would say they had tackled him, uh, the AP, which would say that they had subdued the attacker. All those are true statements. Though, uh, you know, if you think about this in terms of newsworthiness, what's more likely to grab a reader's attention to go and say the students pounced on the attacker or to say the students went and got their guns and used them to stop the attacker? My guess is. In terms of people's perceptions of what they regard as, as rare, particularly in part because of the coverage, somebody reading that would say, You see this, the students got their guns. It'd be much more likely that people would talk about it among themselves and, and, and register there than they were the way it was reported. So I asked the reporters, Why is it that they didn't go and mention a stat in their coverage? And Marie Blaude, of course, the Post, for example, was fairly typical, where she said, that she had space constraints. She only had 913 words to do the story. And said she simply didn't have enough space in her story to go and mention the students that had gone and used their guns to stop it. You know, there are lots of other uh, examples of bias I can go and talk about with regard to uh, the media there. I mean, I'll get to more in a few minutes. But uh, just to give you really quickly a couple other ideas about how people's perceptions about guns are affected. And I, like, I'm sure for most people from an international audience, uh, you're even less likely, if that's possible, than Americans to know about these types of defensive gun uses which have stopped these crimes. You may remember about a lot of these attacks, but the notion that some of these attacks that you heard about were actually stopped by citizens with guns is something you're completely unlikely to have heard of, I would guess. And there are many attacks which are stopped before anybody gets killed with, by citizens with guns that rarely even get local media attention in the United States. There are cases I can give you in the last year involving uh, attacks that have occurred on city streets or uh, in parks or other places. Uh, you may have heard about one case that did get some news, but it was uh, fairly misreported in terms of an attack at uh, a church in Colorado where somebody who was referred to as a security guard had stopped this attack going in there, two people had been killed. Uh, a woman there wasn't a security guard. She was someone who had gotten a permit to carry a concealed handgun. Her ex-husband had, uh, had been threatening her. And uh, she had gone and asked the minister whether it was okay for her to carry a permit concealed handgun with her to the service. And some of the other parishioners have heard about that also, and the minister said fine. And uh, when the attack had started, when the person came in, there was like 7,000 people inside the church there at the time, but she was able to 
kill the dog and for him to, to go in and harm it. But even though he had something like a thousand rounds of ammunition uh, and when, uh, when he engaged in the attack there. Uh, but just one other minor point, you know, people seem to think of these types of attacks as being a uniquely American experience, but yet Europe has had more than a share of these types of attacks in just like the last six years or so. Germany, for example, uh, has the two most deadly uh, high school attacks uh, in the last six years. There's one attack in Germany in which 17 people were killed, another one in which 14 people were killed. Uh, uh, Switzerland had an attack at uh, uh, Canton, uh, Zub, uh, in which in the parliament of building in 14 people killed. Uh, you've had other attacks in France, you have uh, at least four attacks in France in which more than seven people have been killed. Uh, and you could go down the list for, uh, for these different countries. Uh, and, but let me just give you two other ways I think people get information and it colors their views on this with this quickly. Uh, one is in terms of government studies that are done, the other is in terms of polling. If you look at studies done by the federal government in the United States, there are literally hundreds of studies that come out in a period of uh, a few years. I looked at all the federal government studies that came out over a 15 year period prior to writing my book, The Bias Against Guns. And one of the amazing things is that none of the studies that I looked at could you identify any attempt to try to go and measure the benefits from the law and guns. So let me give you a simple example. Every year, the federal government comes out with a report on the top 10 gun use crime. Why not one year? Why not one time come out with a report on the top 10 gun use defensively by people to protect themselves? Almost every year, the federal government comes out with a report on the cost of the country from injuries caused by guns. Why not one time come out with a report that would go and measure injuries prevented from people being able to use guns defensively? Surely we understand the benefit from going and measuring the costs of these things. It's relevant for going and deciding what type of legislation presidents are going to sign, or congresses are going to pass, or state legislatures are going to end up. But it's kind of hard to figure out by only measuring the cost how that's going to be particularly useful. You know, there's costs and benefits for all these things, and it seems like you want to have some studies that would measure the benefits. I'll give you an example. I looked again over a 15 year period of time. I cannot find one single poll that in any way allowed respondents to go and mention benefits from people owning guns. So, for example, every year, uh, uh, you'd have NBC News would have a poll that would go and ask people, you think gun control reduces crime a lot, somewhat, or just a little bit? Those were your three options. Uh, Zombie had a poll that was a little bit more balanced. It would have go and ask people, do you think gun control reduces crime a lot, somewhat, or has no net effect? Now, maybe it's just myself as an economist, but I think everything has costs and benefits. Let me give you a, a simple example. That's there. And that is, uh, you have something like waiting periods in the United States. Some states may require you to wait a couple of days before you can buy a gun. Some might be a week, some might be a month. And it's pretty obvious what the possible benefits are there. Somebody may have set a thought between when they think about getting a gun and they would have committed the crime and made them wait a few days. Maybe they'll change their mind and decide not to do it. That's surely a possible benefit that you'd want to take into account. But on the other hand, there could be real costs from having those types of restrictions. A woman may be threatened or stalked, may face serious dangers, and making her go and wait a few days may be the difference between whether or not she's going to be able to go and be able to go and defend herself or not. So you have both costs and benefits there. It's not obvious before you go and study what the net effect's going to be. But in fact, if you look at all the academic research that's been done on that issue, there's not one single academic study that I know of by either criminologists or economists that find that waiting periods are associated with reductions in any type of violent crime. There are a number of studies that find that, that waiting periods are associated with small increases, maybe about two or three percent, in terms of rape rates. Um, let me give you another example. It's probably more controversial. 
And that is uh, with regard to these multiple victim home shootings that we're talking about. Uh, you know, uh, I'm an academic. It's not something I take lightly like, like, about the campus. But I can't decide. I can't go back to the campus. And I assume that we have to do it. So we say, you're not sitting here. You're from Canada. But it's the end of that's part of the world. It's like people like Mabel. It turns out that it's like the laws of Mabel. You may end up on the other one hand. I mean, it's like, let's say, it's not a really thing where your family was stalking you. Would you feel safe from putting a sign in front of your house that said this home is a gun free zone? Would that, would that make you feel a lot safer? In my guess, most people would think that's probably not the wisest use of your time. That there are probably other things that you should do with your time. You're talking about the best way. 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 You're talking being taken in there. Those are the one of those was where the attack occurred. Similar type of phenomenon in Salt Lake, similar type of case in Kansas City. One of the things that probably a lot of people don't know is you know the Columbine. Um, maybe there's one thing I should tell you before. There are 40 states in the United States that allow adults to go and carry permanent concealed handguns. Once you're a certain age, if you're 18 or 21, depending upon the state. Once you pass a criminal background check, about half the states require some type of training uh, and you pay a fee. But once you've met certain objective criteria and you apply for a permit, then it's automatically granted. There are about 5 million Americans right now who are legally able to go and carry a permanent concealed handgun. And, uh, and for most of the area, in most of these 40 states, they're able to do it. There are other age states which are more restrictive. It's much harder to get a permit, but you can still do it. And there are only two states in the United States, Illinois and Wisconsin, that ban citizens from being able to carry permit concealed handguns. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, the interesting thing is how. Bill Landis, I'll mention this. Bill Landis at the University of Chicago and I looked at all the multiple victim home shootings in the United States from 1977 through 1999. And what we found is that the normal type of things that affect crime generally don't affect these multiple victim home shootings. You know, higher arrest rates, higher conviction rates, longer prison sentences, and death penalty. They may affect murder rates generally, but they don't affect multiple victim home shootings. And we think that there's a pretty simple explanation for that. And that is about 75% of the time people go and commit these crimes, they die at the scene. They're either killed by somebody else who brings a gun in or they commit suicide. And in fact, in interviews of the 25% who live, uh, it appears that virtually all of those expected to commit suicide but just weren't able to go and make themselves commit suicide. There's also a third area I'll just briefly mention is called police assistance suicide, where a lot of these killers themselves can't bring themselves to kill themselves. And so, what they do is they put the police in a situation where the police have to kill them. That's kind of gray areas to know how to classify uh, some of these things. But the point is, is that these people go into these attacks with the notion that they're going to die. And so, the thing with law enforcement generally, is that it imposes penalties on the people after the fact. And so the fact that you might have the death penalty or longer prison sentences or more likely prison sentences for these people, why do you stop murders generally? For these guys, it's largely irrelevant because they're not expecting to be around after, uh, after the attack occurred. We also look at uh, uh, 13 different types of gun control. And the only one that we were able to find that had any impact on the rate at which these types of attacks occurred were the passage of these right to carry laws. When states passed these laws, there was about a 60% drop in the rate at which multiple victim public shootings occurred. And to the extent to which these attacks still occurred, they overwhelmingly uh, took place in the areas where the permanent concealed handguns weren't allowed. You know, um, it's pretty understandable why 
these types of tags get the coverage that they do. I, because of the research that I've done, I've gotten to know uh, a couple dozen people who have been present at these tags. And um, the feelings of all utter helplessness that these people feel when these attacks occur is just overwhelming. Uh, one woman who I've gotten to know pretty well, uh, her name is Susanna Huff. Uh, she was president of the Lucas Cafeteria attack in uh, in '93, in which up until the Virginia Tech attack was the most deadly multiple shooting attack in the United States. She's a very attractive woman. Uh, she had had an uh, ex-boyfriend who was giving her a lot of trouble. And she had talked to a friend of hers who was a district attorney in the United States about what she should do. And the district attorney said, go and get a gun and carry it with you. And that was illegal. I mean, it was illegal for her to do that. But she followed his advice and frankly trusted him. And so for about a half a year, she was regularly carrying from a concealed handgun in Bradley. But she just felt bad breaking the law. And so uh, what happened was uh, uh, one morning she went to Target practice shooting, uh, had done in her purse, and was walking into a movie's cafeteria restaurant in Killeen, Texas. And she remembered to herself her promise about breaking the law that was there. And so she went back to her car, her, put her permanent concealed handgun in the car, and locked it away, and then went back to the restaurant to go and join uh, her parents. And uh, uh, ten minutes later, uh, this crazy guy comes barreling through the plate glass windows of the restaurant in his pickup truck, gets out and starts shooting people. She could see her car through the broken plate glass window. But anybody who was trying to run out of the restaurant at the time was being killed by the, the attack. And uh, the only reason why she lived was she faced she played with death. But her father trying to stop the attack when the horse back was turned, picked up a butter knife, tried to charge the guy, got within 10 feet, the killer turned around and shot him. Her mom, she tried to hold her mom so but losing her mom lost control, ran over, cradled her dying husband there. The killer came over and shot her one blind in the head. Uh, you know, Susanna can see all this, but obviously she didn't stop it because her gun was, was locked in her car. And I hear these tech stories all the time. So I understand the desire, you know, the newsworthiness of these attacks get. But you just will not find news stories mentioning that these attacks, time after time, are occurring in these places where guns are banned. And it's just not true in the United States. You look at the attacks in Europe, you know, even Switzerland. The attacks that have occurred have taken place, one in the parliament building, where recently, after 1999, they banned uh, uh, people being, or had some restrictions on where you could carry concealed handguns in Switzerland. And in other places, you see uh, similar types of restrictions. And my guess is a lot of the debate would be different if even once in a while they would go and mention, oh, and by the way, there's been another attack. This occurred in places where permanent concealed handguns are allowed. Because at some point, I think we begin to register on people that there's some common factor uh, that's occurring. You know, uh, one other issue I, I can talk about the permanent concealed handguns and uh, multiple people shooting for a while. I'll, I'll mention one other thing before I go on, and that is uh, uh, it's Interesting, when you read the diaries or notes that are left behind by killers in these cases, how much they're driven by the publicity. Now, they often talk about the fact that if they can go and kill more people than have been killed in these other attacks, that uh, you know, they'll get a lot of news coverage. It's kind of a way, if somebody's going to commit suicide, to go and commit suicide in a way that they kind of, you know, everybody knows who they are when uh, they commit suicide. Um, it's also interesting how cognizant these people are about whether or not permanent concealed handguns are allowed in different areas. One thing that probably most of you don't know, I'm sure even, obviously, people from outside the United States have heard about the Columbine School attack uh, uh, that occurred uh, in, uh, in 99. And uh, uh, you know probably a lot of things about but probably a couple of things you don't know. One is is that 
uh, Dylan Klebold, one of the attackers there, was writing to state legislators regularly, apparently, lobbying as the concealed handgun bill that was going through the state legislature. <laughs> and the one thing that upset him in particular was uh, the state law at that time would have allowed permanent concealed handguns on school property. And uh, the other thing that people don't know is the day of the attack was the same day that later that afternoon the Colorado State Legislature was scheduled to have final votes on passage of the concealed handgun law that was before the state legislature. There. And, um, you know, you mentioned that to people, and I guess they're usually hardly anybody has heard that. Now, let me give you one other area that I think has had a big impact on gun ownership, and that is the, the perception that there's real risk of people having guns in the home. In fact, uh, there's been a big push for some restrictions on guns in Switzerland in part because of this. I don't know the Switzerland data uh, as well. But it's been that same type of debate in the United States. Uh, during the 1990s, you had uh, a lot of public service ads put out by the Clinton administration, which would go and show the voices or pictures of young children between the ages of three and seven, never a voice or picture of a child over that age. And the impression was that there was an epidemic of actual gun deaths that were occurring in the home. And uh, you can go and look at the data. It's on the Centers for Disease Control website. Uh, they have amazingly detailed data by the type of gun uh, used in uh, actual deaths, where the state it occurred, the age of the person who was killed. So you could find the number of five-year-olds killed in North Carolina in 1992, if you were interested by handgun shots. Uh, in, in 2003, for example, there were 20 actual gun deaths involving children under age 10. Uh, there were 53 actual gun deaths involving children under age 15 in the United States. Obviously, it'd be better if it was zero in any of these cases, rather than 20 and 53. But I think even those numbers give people a misimpression of what's happening. Because what I did was I took each of those cases and did this nexus search that I mentioned before to get additional information outside of what they had in, uh, in uh, CDC. And what you find is about two thirds of the time that children die from actual gunshots. It's not what people think where a child gets a hold of a gun and accidentally fires it. About two thirds of the time are adult males with violent criminal histories, criminal records who are the ones who fire the guns and kill these children. They're not in law-abiding homes. In fact, many even of the kids when they fire are not law-abiding And, uh, you know, most of these cases, the adult males, it's illegal for them to even own a gun. Uh, these are the ones who are firing. And, uh, uh, you know, so between 1995 and 2001, you have on average about eight cases a year where a child under 10 either accidentally shoots themselves to death or another child under 10. Uh, you know, just by way of comparison, uh, you have on average about 36 children under the age of five who drown in five gallon plastic water bottles in the United States. Now, five gallon plastic water bottles is a particularly dangerous type of water bucket because they tend to be relatively narrower at the top. You have many more gallons, you're going to wire them. And if it's narrow, the child falls in, the toddler, it may be harder for them to extricate themselves. Uh, but it's heavy enough that it's not going to tip over if the child falls into it. But you can look at things like children dying in uh, bathtubs. You have about 95 children a year under age five who drown in bathtubs in the United States. And uh, all sorts of things. So I, I guess we just argue with 40 million kids under age 10, it's pretty hard to think of almost any other item that's in American homes where you have as high of an accidental death rate as you have with, with guns, uh, or low of an accidental death rate as you have with guns. But that's not people's perceptions, and I think a lot of it, again, has to do with media coverage. I often get calls from the media when states are thinking about passing laws that require people to lock up their guns. Okay. And uh, and uh, what I started to do is to go and ask uh, reporters some questions when they call me. So one of the questions is, you know, why do they think that these incredibly rare events get the news coverage that they do? 
And usually the response that I get is, well, because it's so rare. You know, the man bites the dog is much more of a news story than the dog bites the man. And I tell them, I don't really find that very convincing in this case, because I can give them lots of very rare, very gruesome ways that kids die that are as rare, slightly less rare, and slightly more rare than actual gun deaths. But the second question I ask them is, well, if that's true, what do you think the impression is that people who watch these news stories come away? Do they come away with the impression that this was covered because it's such an incredibly rare event? Or do they come away with the impression that this represents a real threat to children's safety? And my guess is the most of them that I've asked that to can see that it's the latter case, that in fact, uh, people are scared and do not own a gun because they're convinced that there's an epidemic of accidental gun deaths that are occurring and it represents a real threat uh, to, uh, to kids' safety. I can go on and give you more information on that, but let me just summarize with a couple of things. And that is, uh, police are extremely important in stopping crime. My research indicates to me that police are probably the single most important factor for stopping crime. But I think one of the things the police understand themselves is that they virtually always arrive on the crime scene after the crime occurred. And that raises an important question. What do you advise someone to do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves? And it simply turns out that passive behavior is actually fairly risky. By far the safest course of action for people to take when they're confronted by a criminal is to have a gun. It's particularly true for people who are relatively weaker physically. Women and the elderly benefit much more from having a gun when they're attacked by a criminal than men do, uh, simply because there's such a large strength differential that exists between a male criminal attacker and a, and a female victim. Uh, the other thing I just point out in summary is that there are basically two groups of people who benefit the most. One is people who are relatively weak physically. But the other group are basically people who are most likely to be victims of crime. And that in the United States is going to be poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas. The fact, you know, two of the most vulnerable groups in society are most, uh, 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 who benefit the most from having guns killed to protect themselves. Um, and I appreciate your time. Uh, and, uh, you know, tomorrow I'll be happy to answer any other questions.